Hello, and welcome to our new episode of Meet the Innovators in Healthcare, where we interview healthcare innovators that are shaping the future of patient care and the patient experience. We talk with experts in the field of music medicine, music therapy, surgery, anesthesia, and lots more. I'm Dr. Alice Cash, founder and CEO of Surgical Serenity Solutions, a company dedicated to improving the patient experience during surgery and other medical procedures by decreasing anxiety and pain perception through music. Today, I am gonna be interviewing Brian Harris, the founder and CEO of a company called MedRhythms, a company focused on helping patients with Parkinson's disease, strokes, and other neurological situations by using music and rhythmic entrainment. Brian is a music therapist and a neurologic music therapist who uses the power of rhythmic entrainment to work with patients recovering from strokes and living with Parkinson's disease. Brian presents at conferences around the world and is growing his company into an important and highly regarded digital therapeutics company. Welcome, Brian. So glad to have you here today. Good I'm really excited, Brian, to hear about your work and uh, how you do what you do and how you got into it. So my first question for you, Brian, is who is your ideal patient to benefit from med rhythms? Well, thanks, Alice. Um, our uh, ideal patient really is, you know, we're really focused on um, improving walking following neuro disease and injury. So those are folks that have walking deficits, but really could be due to any sort of neuro injury or disease. And so our, our first product is focused on the chronic stroke population. So these are folks that are um, at least three to six months post-stroke when they have chronic walking deficits living in their home. Um, but you know the science supports that it could be applicable across Parkinson's disease and MS and cerebral palsy, traumatic brain injury, acute stroke as well. So really across uh, that spectrum. Okay. All right. That's wonderful. And can you describe just generally in a nutshell, how the solution, med rhythm solution for working with patients? Yeah. So we have, uh, we're building what we call digital therapeutics. So these are products that are evidence-based. So they go through rigorous clinical trials. They are regulated by the FDA and prescription products. Um, and so uh, when we think about digital therapeutics, we actually think about our products much more like a, uh, even a pharmaceutical um, would be, except the therapeutic just happens to be delivered via software. So we're improving walking, as I mentioned. So what the product actually looks like is that we have sensors that connect to the shoe that collect clinical grade biomechanics in real time. So we get everything about stride length and symmetry and cadence, speed, et cetera. That data feeds into our algorithms, which are based upon a mobile device. And then we deliver music via headphones. Um, and really, uh, the products are based upon the neuroscience of music. So cutting edge research and how rhythm can engage the human motor system to improve walking outcomes, something that we call auditory motor entrainment. So that's the, the underlying mechanism of action is using an external rhythmic cue to engage right. the motor system to improve walking. That is so exciting. And so are you saying that all of the possible diseases that would uh, lead to this intervention, they all have the sensors on the shoe, in other words, Parkinson's, stroke, MS? Yeah, so our first, our first product, uh, which is for chronic stroke, has the sensors on the shoe, the mobile device, and the headphones. Um, we are in early stages, so we're in clinical trials, early clinical trials on our product in Parkinson's disease and MS. Mm -hmm. So what we need to figure out as we go through our development cycle is also uh, the usability uh, of the product. So there were very specific reasons that were uh, related to the stroke population of why we used sensors on the shoe. Uh, but as we think about MS and Parkinson's disease, there may be opportunities for sensors elsewhere. So maybe it's a sensor on the phone or maybe it's a sensor on a hip or whatever that might be. Um, all of our clinical trials are done with our product that have sensors on the shoe, but the actual commercial version of the product might look a little bit different. Okay. So a session of this would take place in a hospital or a rehab center? 
we're actually designing the interventions to be used completely autonomously in home. So we want to be able to deliver the intervention in home without the need of a clinician present. So we've really optimized our design and sort of clinical thinking um, to be able to focus on that in-home use. Wonderful. And so the patient could do it like after they've been in a rehab hospital at home by themselves going forward. Correct. So once, you know, particularly for our stroke survivors that we're treating, um, after they've gone through the rehab process, um, maybe inpatient, outpatient therapy, it's something that they could continue to do in their home um, for longer periods of time. Wonderful. And so tell me a little bit about the headphones. Are these Bluetooth or are they wired? So the ones that we actually ship with the product um, are Bluetooth headphones. Um, and uh, we use uh, a certain kind of bone conduction headphones, which we've received good feedback on. Again, this is sort of the design process that we've um, worked with end users being stroke survivors to begin with. Um, and we've gotten really good feedback about these headphones because uh, they actually sit in the front of the ears canal oh, okay. so that people can actually still hear their environment because it's a walking intervention. Yes. So if they're walking down the street, they can still hear that. Um, but we have built the product to be um, sort of agnostic to headphones because we also know that people are very particular about the, the uh, headphones that they use. So people can bring wired headphones, they can bring their own headphones because it's, it, I say simply, it's a, a music delivery device. So it can really be any headphones that somebody likes to, to listen to, but we supply Bluetooth headphones. I see. Okay, so if you're supplying Bluetooth, what are they streaming the music from the headphones? Yeah, they stream the music from the mobile device. So the, for the strokes, or for the kit for chronic stroke, um, it consists of two sensors that are also Bluetooth um, connected to the shoe, a mobile device. So looks like a phone, but it's not a phone, doesn't have any you know, phone connections. It's, it's just our application on the mobile device. And then Bluetooth headphones. All of that is actually hard coded to the mobile device so that when a person starts it up for the first time, they actually don't have to connect the headphones or connect the, the Bluetooth sensors. It's all pre hard coded to the product. So there's That's no right. wires um, mm -hmm. connecting each of the pieces, but it's right. all hard coded via Bluetooth. And where does the mobile device stay during the process? So we encourage folks to put it in their pocket, actually to walk with it. Um, you know, there's a certain range, Bluetooth range of right. sensors. So it's going right. to be close-ish. But if somebody's using it in their home, they could set it on a counter or something. But we Table. encourage people to, to keep it on them, but keep it in their in their pocket. I think that makes a lot of sense. And so we're not talking about a phone. Is it like a little mini iPad or something? So, I mean, it looks like a phone. I mean, it looks like an Android device. Uh, but there's just no... There's no uh, uh, phone uh, connection capability. So can't make uh -huh. calls. It's, it's really uh, kiosked uh, just for our application. Wonderful. Okay. And so, how do you offer the patients the choice of music? What What do you tell them before they yes. go with the music? Well, as we were building the product, it was really important for us that um, we could figure out a way to use user preferred music. Because right. user preferred music, number one, has been shown in the research to be able to elicit greater functional results in the intervention that we do to improve walking. So that was important to us to maximize the clinical benefit. But also, um, it's really important for us to think about adherence. As I said, this is an in-home product. So people mm -hmm. actually have to use it. So we want it to be engaging. We want it to be motivating. Sure. In fact, we, we want it to be fun as well. So it was really important for us to, to use user preferred music. Um, so with that, you know, we, we announced recently that we partnered with uh, Universal Music Group, which yes. is the largest record label uh, in the world, for access to their content. Um, essentially, we have access to nearly their entire catalog of music and to use it the way that we do therapeutically in our, our platform. Um, and so the way that the user gets to pick is um, at the beginning, we put together genre specific playlists. And so people get to pick whether it's you know R&B or Motown or uh, classic rock, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. um, and then we really have a nearly an unlimited catalog of music to continue to update these playlists with, um, ensuring that the songs are therapeutically valuable. Um, but right. that's how uh, you know we get to that 
user preferred nature of it. Okay. And so, I mean, just asking as a, as a musician also, does the music need to have a steady tempo in order for the <clears throat> rhythmic entrainment to be present? Yeah, we need certain uh, what we call beat salience, which is essentially that how strongly defined the beats are, needs to have a certain rhythmic structure, needs to have a certain time signature um, as well, um, which is part of what our technology does is able ability to screen it um, to ensure that it has those parameters. Like 4-4 four, four time or 3-4? Yeah, some sort of duple meter, like 4-4, four, 2-4, four, four, you know. 6-8 even. Yeah. Eight, even correct. So, but I mean, if somebody says, oh, I want to hear Bohemian Rhapsody, what do you say? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Bohemian Rhapsody may be a little bit difficult, um, even just due to the vari variation of the tempo, et cetera. Exactly. You know, we think about this really, as we think about music, really, it has to be through both an objective lens and a subjective lens. So, and in fact, the objective lens is the more important lens that we need to look at being mm -hmm. we know what type of music or rhythmic structure from a from an objective perspective so time signature rhythmic salience tempo etc is necessary to engage the human motor system to improve those outcomes in walking so that must be there first second is the subjective meaning what we like as humans or as the users Mm -hmm. So we can hear what the patients like or the end users like to listen to and then ensure that it has those objective parameters. You can have music that somebody doesn't like, but has those objective parameters and it will still work. Right. But you can't have a song that doesn't have those parameters that somebody likes in order to get a functional outcome. Exactly. So we try to get both, but it's not always possible with every single song that's ever been. Uh, of you know, course. We have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, end users that say, love certain classical pieces. There are some classical pieces that would work great for walking, uh, but Absolutely. there are certain that are just aren't uh, appropriate to be able to engage the brain the way that we want to. Of course, like Afternoon of a Fawn would not work, but <laughs> correct. a, a correct. Sousa March might. Sousa March may, correct. Or even the Nutcracker, parts of the Nutcracker. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's a, I mean, there's, there is a wide variety and a wide spectrum of things that could be appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, across genres, time absolutely. ranges, uh, eras of music, um, but it's not uh, in every song can work. Oh, absolutely not. But I mean, if you know that people want classic rock, I mean, could you mention some of the classic rock tunes that, you know, are effective, like we are the champions or something? Yeah, I mean, when you look at the classic rock genre, most music is going to be applicable because most classic rock is very steady. It's typically in 4-4 time. Right. So when you think about that even, you know, you look at things like, uh, you know, even most pop music, right? Today's pop music is in 4-4. Most uh, classic rock, most Motown, these types of things are in these time signatures. So, you know, I would I would wager to say that most of those types of popular music um, will be uh, applicable Simple. to be used within. Yeah. That is so cool. Well, um, what would you say is the main age range, the predominant age range you have worked with successfully? Well, I mean, as we think about chronic stroke, so this is different phases, right? So what the research supports is that uh, this is really based upon uh, the neuroscience of music and what we call human perception and production, which is essentially the human brain's response to music, which is objective across 97% of the human population. So they've shown through neuroscience and neuroimaging uh, research that everybody's brain objectively responds the same to music, regardless of age, culture, ability, or disability. That's so in right. my, my background as a clinician myself, as a board certified music therapist and neurologic music therapist treating patients in the hospital, I mean, I've treated patients from, you know, early after birth to nearly end of life. And we've seen um, uh, clinical responses across the board. So mm -hmm. that's what gets us very uh, optimistic about the potential of music as a healthcare medium is because it's really a universal stimulus that can be used to improve uh, outcomes. Now, if we circle that back 
to um, our products at, uh, at MedRhythms, we are at first focused on the adult population. Right. And then when we look at stroke uh, in particularly, I mean, that's largely um, an older population. I say older right. being uh, in the, uh, what we would consider sort of mid to older adults, 65 plus. Mm -hmm. um, but really, you know, the potential is across the board. But currently, what is the predominant age range? For the, you yeah, for stroke, it's primarily 65 plus. 65 plus, okay. So you can probably sort of predict what music they are going to request. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can look at uh, that population in terms of age range and bucket it into probably three or four different genres or styles of right. music. That would be, get you in the ballpark, at least in terms of what people may like, what they may appreciate. Uh, obviously there's always outliers. Um, right, so of course. You know, I, I, I will never forget some of my most memorable moments of treating patients in the hospital where you meet a, you know, an 80, 85 year old stroke survivor who says that they love Maroon 5 and Adam Levine is their favorite artist, you know? Uh, so those, those outliers do exist and we, we love that. And, you know, uh, but uh, for the most part, you can, you can ballpark it. Right, right. Could you give just a, a thumbnail sketch of one of your cases that was very effective or dramatic or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's actually, so I, and the one that I always like to give for an example for this is actually I, what I would say the case that really started it all for med rhythms, mm -hmm. which was me treating a patient in the hospital. So if we think about just even the history of how the company came about, I was a clinician at Spalding Rehab Hospital in Boston, which is the Harvard Medical School affiliate for neuro rehab hospitals. I was their first music therapist. So I built their, their, their music therapy program, treating primarily in stroke and brain injury patients. Mm -hmm. And we were really seeing that patients were getting better faster with greater results. And we now had the neuroscience that we could not only explain how this was possible, but also how we could standardize and replicate it. So that really started to planting the seed of figuring out, you know, how do we bring this care to more people who need it? And yes. very quickly after starting that program, the, both the demand for my services, both from the physicians, but also from patients and their family members who, as you can imagine, were saying, you know, Brian, you helped my dad walk again. How it's do I miracle. get more of this when I leave the hospital? Yeah. And at the time, the answer was really, there's nothing you can do. That's an awful conversation to have with somebody right. on a regular basis. And so really that was the, the, the seed that said, we need to figure out a way to bring this to more people. And the answer to that is technology. There's simply not enough music therapists, neurologic music, music therapists, I mean, clinicians in general. Right. You know, there's, a, there's not enough PTs in the world for the need that there are, there is. Right. So we started thinking about technology. And when we really sort of I would say that the one case that really pushed this over the edge for us um, in thinking about focusing on walking, thinking about figuring out how to do this um, through technology was a patient of mine whose name was George. And I actually have his video is up on, uh, on our YouTube page. Oh. And it's a video of me treating him, doing the intervention with live music. So this was pre-technology, um, pre-digital therapeutic. And he had had about three weeks of physical therapy five or six days a week for about an hour a day. So that was, you know, um, well, 15 to 20 sessions of physical therapy at Spalding uh -huh. when I um, uh, met him for the first time. And he was walking at that point when I met him. He had made some good progress since his stroke, but he had a very uh, um, uh, affected side. His right side uh, was not moving the same side or uh, same way as his left side which we call an asymmetry. So his right steps right. were a different size than his left steps. He was using a cane still, taking mm. very short steps and walking at about 65 steps per minute. Um, for some context, that's quite slow. I mean, average cadence for an adult human, it's dependent upon age and height, but generally speaking, it's in the 105 to 110 oh. um, steps per minute. So he's walking very slowly and asymmetrically. And we started doing this intervention that's called rhythmic auditory stimulation. So it's using live, we were using at the time, live music played by me with a guitar to try to get him to walk more symmetrical, symmetrically and to improve his cadence or in, increase his speed. 
over the course of one 45 minute session. And this was our first session. And we happened to actually capture this on film. Um, <laughs> and uh, within one 45 minute session, he was able to walk without his cane for the first time post stroke. Wow. His imagery improved drastically. And he was walking about twice as fast and about three times the distance that he had ever walked. So he's oh walking about goodness. three times the distance that he had walked with a cane, but he was walking without a cane with improved speed and quality. And it was really more of a, when we, when, especially when you watch it, it was really this, what you would almost consider to be this miraculous response. Right, right. Particularly when you think about the fact that he had had three weeks of traditional physical therapy. Mm -hmm. and this is not at all me saying that physical therapy is bad. I mean, physical oh, no, therapy no. is wonderful, but we're using a new stimulus to engage the brain in a novel way that improves right. these outcomes. And that was really the seed that planted that said, we have to do something about this to bring this to people that need it. So was George aware in the moment of the, the huge progress that was being made? Yeah, I, what was amazing about George uh, in particular, George is, is a very, uh, uh, a very uh, engaged, bright man and was very engaged in his process throughout um, his recovery. Um, and it was amazing to hear him talk about what it felt like to walk pre uh, the, the intervention and post the intervention. He actually walked around the, the uh, hospital after that, telling people that I had saved his life. Oh, wow. And, you know, what an honor for me to hear that, yes. but it just demonstrates the need. And you think about, well, if you can explain his outcome via neuroscience and you can replicate his outcome with other patients, why doesn't every single person on earth have access to this when right. they have some sort of neuro disease and injury. Absolutely. Absolutely. And how long did it take to get from the case with George and the live playing the guitar to having the sensors and the more digital approach? How many years? Yeah, years. It took years. And, the, you know, for a couple of reasons. Number one, when we have first started the company and thinking about scaling and getting this to more people, Sure. It was original that we said, well, let's hire other clinicians and start treating patients at home. And so that's how we started. We hired other neurologic music therapists to treat patients at home. We quickly realized that that was not going to reach the scale that mm -hmm. we had dreamed of. There's simply not enough clinicians to treat the need that there is. Right. So we said, how do we take this to the next level? The answer is technology. Right. Well, to go that's a, that's maybe an easy cognitive switch. That's not an easy technical switch. Exactly. And so we spent years um, in development of first, you know, figuring out what the sensors would be, then training our algorithms. You know, we, we call them clinical thinking algorithms. So, you know, it's an automated system. So the data comes in from the sensors on the shoe and then the music changes in real time based upon the data that's coming in like a clinician would do. So we had to spend thousands of hours training the algorithm of to course. respond like a human would. Then we have to get the clinical trials right. So we have to design clinical trials, run clinical trials. And then, you know, the business of healthcare is, uh, is challenging. So that means you yes. then have to go through processes with the FDA and you have to go through uh, processes of building a product that people actually can use in home, right? So it's not just about a, a product that works clinically, it also needs to be able to be used in home. Right. right. So you have to go through those processes, design, product design. Um, you have to also think about, um, you know, how these things may be commercialized into the future. Because for us, it was always about, you know, this is not a research tool, right? This is something for people to use. Practical. Uh, in their home. Yes. Then you have to think about music too, right? Which is yes. a, is not, a, I would say, an easy process to think about how do you get access to music to you. So, you know, that process takes years to do. And how did you ultimately hook up with the Universal Library people? Yeah, we received an introduction to some of the folks at, at Universal um, a couple of years ago, actually, and began these conversations about thinking about how we might partner together. And really thinking about a true partnership here of, you know, it's content, but also 
there's a there's a lot of value that a, a record label brings to an organization like ours and also a lot of value that we bring to an organization like Universal too. This is the first type of partnership of its kind in the music industry uh-huh. of using music for it, what will become, you know, uh, a prescription uh, product, um, which once, you know, should we be fortunate enough to get our FDA approval will be the world's first prescription music. So an actual music that's prescribed by a doctor, et cetera. So, you know, it, it, there was a lot of work to goes into figuring out how we might work together. Like, what right. does this look like? And, and how do we structure a, a relationship that really is beneficial to both? And they've been amazing partners thus far. Wonderful. And speaking of a prescription, uh, is there going to be any insurance reimbursement down the road? Well, that's something that we are actively working on uh, at the moment, because when we think about having a product that's successful, right? When we think about our vision and what success looks like, success to me is tied much more to making sure that patients who need it have access to it, right? right? Success isn't necessarily size of company or or, or revenue goal. Success is impact and success is global impact. And fundamentally, we don't have the impact that I dream that we can have without third-party reimbursement. And so it all has always been in the plan that um, this becomes covered um, uh, by third party re, re, uh, third parties um, across the board. So we are actively working on that now um, as we're building up for commercial launch to figure out how we can best make that happen. Um, and hopefully as soon as we can, but also one of those things that just takes time. Exactly, exactly. Well, I will be following that closely because that's that's always been a big issue for me as well. Uh, and I do know of a therapist in California like 30 years ago, you're familiar with Bell Ruth Napperstack? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She was able to get insurance reimbursement from Blue Cross Blue Shield of California for her tapes that she would give to oncology patients mm-hmm. uh, before they had surgery or something that was a combination of music, sort of new age music and affirmations. And mm-hmm. the insurance company not only said, we will cover the cost of this, but we will not cover the procedure unless you use it. Mm-hmm. Now that and there to me are, is the dream. <laughs> that is a dream. That is a dream. And we are seeing some cases across the country of uh, you know music therapists, neurologic music therapists, getting some reimbursement by insurance companies uh, from, for their services on a case by case basis. But what we need is widespread reimbursement yes. uh, across geographies, across plans, across private and public insurers. That's really where, where, where the needle gets moved. And so that's, you know, what we, are, what we are really driving for. Yes, that'll be a major game changer right there that day. And, sure and I will. believe it'll happen, but you just keep, you know, keep hanging in there and doing the next right thing. Yeah, I mean perhaps a bit of idealism here, but, you know, I fundamentally believe that if you have a product, call that a physical product, something, an intervention, right? it fundamentally changes people's lives and improves their lives in a way that is replicable, that you can demonstrate with real clinical evidence, that you can replicate with neuroscience research and explain with neuroscience research, there must be a way to get it to everybody that needs it. So yes. while that will be hard, while there will be a lot of roadblocks, while there'll be a lot of mountains to climb, there is a path to get there. And it will take a lot of time, but you know, I, I fundamentally believe at my core that there's a path to that end. I do too. I do too, Brian. Okay, one final question. If someone right. in Louisville, Kentucky had a stroke this evening or had a diagnosis of Parkinson's later on today, how could they get in touch with you to benefit from your invention? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways right now. So we are still pre-commercial at the moment because we are uh, still pre-FDA approval. Um, So we will be going through that process in the coming year. Um, But right now we have a a couple of different opportunities. Um, We have what we call uh, our product lab. And our product lab is a a large study where we send our kits to potential end users. So people who might uh, use this and we gather usability feedback. So things about uh, your experience setting up the product, using the product, getting 
product back, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so not a clinical trial, more just general feedback about product. Right. But then we also have a robust pipeline of clinical trials um, that we are doing across MS, Parkinson's disease, acute stroke, et cetera. Wonderful. That, uh, you know, depending on location, people may be able to be involved with. And I hope that both of those pro programs, both the product lab and our clinical trials uh, continue to grow such that, you know, more people can be involved with those, but we have those um, opportunities on our website as well um, for, for folks to, to take a look at. Well, I would just love to introduce all of this to the Louisville community because mm -hmm. we do have a brand new neuro ICU at one of our big hospitals and several big uh, neuro rehab hospitals, things like that. Whether or not we have neurologic music therapists in Kentucky, I'm not sure. We might. I'm sure, I'm sure there. Were, I'm sure there's at least a few um, that are there that could maybe be helpful um, in in the interim. Um, and there's a actually there's an online database um, for the Academy of Neurologic Music Therapy that has all the people uh, broken out by Listen. by state. Um, you know, but there's a you know there's not many of them, um, which is you know uh, difficult when you think about trying to reach a lot of people. Um, but there are certainly may, they may be helpful in the interim. Right. Well, when we had Barbara Wheeler here, that mm. was wonderful. And she may have done some of that work in Louisville. Uh, I'm not sure. But Barbara Wheeler has been a huge advocate in Kentucky for music therapy wonderful. and actually yeah. started our program at the University of Louisville. And so. for the field is in general. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Brian. This has been wonderful. And I uh, look forward to maybe following up with you in a year or two about third-party reimbursement and, and everything else. And yeah. I'm going to stop the recording for now. And then I have like two little short questions. Great. Off record. Thank you so much again. Well, thanks for having me. Yes. Today, our guest in our interview series was Brian Harris, who is CEO of a wonderful digital therapeutics company called MedRhythms. Brian has helped so many patients suffering from strokes and Parkinson's and other neurologic disorders. And he is himself a neurologic music therapist. Brian, thank you so much for being with us today. And we look forward to watching the progress of your wonderful company, MedRhythms, and look forward to checking in with you again in another year or so. Thanks again. And everybody really enjoy this and listen carefully. This is going to be big. Thank you.